Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 59 for Beltane 2020. Hello and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Thank you, Serona, for doing the housekeeping and how to get in touch with us. And now I'm going to begin by telling you the lineup for today's podcast. First of all, if you're listening to this from the future, which... If you think about it, all of you are, but I think you'll know what I mean. Um, We're recording this in the midst of the COVID-19, everybody stay at home, wear a mask in public, six feet apart, lockdown. So there's a lot of Zoom meetings going on. People are using Zoom and Skype and other web-based portals in which to hold meetings and gatherings. And I'm gonna participate in my first Zoom Beltane ever, hopefully this Sunday. And uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, witches are nothing if not able to roll with the punches. We, you just have to like take whatever the universe gives you and make the best of it. You know, be grateful that we have this ability. Because if this had happened in the 60s or 70s, this would have really been a downer. But since we do have social media and we do have these technologies and platforms, wow, aren't we grateful that we have them? So let's get started with today's program. Our first song is going to be the Brownie song, and that's by Mama Gina, and it's on her album, The Undertaker's Daughter. You can learn more about Mama Gina and purchase her music on mamaginamusic.com. We're going to hear from Alpandia with Pandy's Pagan Projects. She's going to teach us about ice dyeing. And I recently saw someone post something about this on Facebook. So um, you can probably find YouTube videos or Facebook posts about it. But she's going to kind of give you the overall general way to do it. It sounds pretty intriguing. I might have to try it myself. We're going to have an interview with Byron Ballard. Raina interviewed her on Zoom and... Byron has a prayer for the dead that has really made an impact with pagans everywhere. And they'll be talking about that and presenting the prayer. That's going to be towards the end of the program. And after that, we will hear a song by the Crow women called Free the Heart, which is on their Crow Goddess album. But first, but first, before we get into that, you're going to hear uh, week one, part one of a beginning astrology class that's given by our own Equitas, and it's called Stars by Joseph. And he has quite a number of ways you can get in touch with him, which are all going to be on the show notes. But a few of the ways are he's on Instagram, he's on Facebook, both under Stars by Joseph, and you can email him at starsbyjoseph at gmail.com. So if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with Joseph. He's great at answering them, and he's really a fun teacher. We're just bringing you week one, part one. Hopefully in the next episode, we'll bring you week one, part two. It is beginning. It is basic astrology. But hey, I've taken a basic astrology class like five or six times, and I can tell you every single time I listen to a different person present the material, I think, oh wow, I didn't know that. Or hey, that's a great way to remember that. It helps it link up in your head because I'm I'm a sometimes astrologer. You know, I know enough to be dangerous mostly to myself, but I find it fascinating to listen to other people explain it. And I always learn something. So I hope you'll enjoy that. And in the meantime, hey, do what everybody else is doing. Stay home, wash your hands, stay safe. Blessed be. Is There's two main mindset changes that if you adopt them, it will make this whole conversation easier. So the one is to change our thinking from linear to cyclical. And this is challenging because everything in modern North American Western society has everything so linear. And to have a more natural cyclical organic approach to 
thinking about things, that is a huge mind shift for us. And our everyday mundane lives don't support that kind of thinking. Yet we are actually more captive to the cyclical than the linear. The other conversation is our whole society is based on math that revolves around one through 10. And we need us all to get used to thinking in 12s. And it's also called base 60 math. And instead of base 10, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And if I have 10 cents and I have 10 packets of 10 cents, that makes a dollar. That's all base 10 type of math. Um, we actually use base 60 every day and you just don't know it. So um, don't be freaked out. Uh, I, I want to give some examples and then I'm going to jump back on video. So, okay, here's a, this sentence has a beginning and an end period. That's very linear and what we call square or rectangle consciousness. And if you think about it, everything in our society is designed with square consciousness. Our buildings are square. We built our, our cities in grids. We live in, our rooms are square. We play games on squares and rectangles, courts, tennis. Yeah, we build a circular stadium, but that's around a square. Our cell phones, our computers, our TVs, everything is square, it's rectangle, and it's, it's symbolic to a type of consciousness. Is there any other examples of like this square consciousness, if anybody's resonating with this conversation? I mean, yeah. just about anything you do. If you take a picture of something, a lot of food that you buy is in a square box. A pizza, a round pizza is in a square box. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, I love that. You know? Books are square. <laughs> yeah, thank our you. Our money Park. is square. Our money that's important <laughs> is right? square. Good stuff. It's square. Yeah. Now, uh, I want you to get this. In nature, there is really no such as a straight line, okay? Like if you look at flowers and trees and bushes, that we don't, we don't have anything that grows. We don't have anything that grows in squares or rectangles. Um, and I, I also, that shape can show up in nature, but it's not like so prevalent as humankind has created. So Joseph, it's, it's not the square. What is it? What is it? Here's a, a concept from a new mindset. So I'm gonna read this and it loops back upon itself. Their seeds giving way to rebirth and growth and fruits, which lived and shined and then when old fell apart, revealing their seeds giving way to rebirth and growth. And you can see like this sentence just goes on and on and on, right? And this is represented by the circle or what we call cyclical consciousness. And what we see in nature, it's all cycles, seasons, curves, and, and, and elliptics, okay? There's no perfect circle either in nature, but the, the symbol of a circle or an oval is, is much more natural. It's what, it, and even in the human body, it's what occurs much, much more, okay? So then the second mindset is 12s and 360s. 12... We have the day cycle and another 12, we have the night cycle, 24 hours right there. Okay. Um, and even in terms of like, not to get too off subject, but even in palmistry, like the different parts of our body are ruled by different signs and planets. So that all that overlays. So in the ancient societies, they would count by 12 because it was much more convenient and also the 12 falls into another number, the circle. And we're going to look at, and, and by the way, yes, if you're already kind of like, ooh, these numbers and stuff, yes, this is all sacred math, sacred numbers and sacred geometry, okay? So you can see the 12 exists naturally here. Now, if we go for the moon cycle, so we've got 24 days, right? And then two more notches. 25, 26, 27, 28. There's the moon cycle, 28. And then the whole, the 29th day is when the moon is either full or completely dark. So all the numbers are right there. It's in our body. It's connected to the, we're all connected, okay? So now base 60. So you're like, Joseph, you said, I use base 60 every day. Okay, what the heck is that? So now if you look at a clock, right? 
that is base 60. When you get up to 59 minutes, we don't keep going 61 minutes, 62 minutes. We, once we get 60 minutes, we have an hour. Okay, so it's 60 seconds make a minute, and then 60 minutes make an hour. There's your base 60. A lot of what we're doing in astrology at work, it's the same system. So when we start putting these degrees and minutes and seconds, you're going to be like, ah, but it's like, no, no, it's, it's clock. You, you deal with clocks all the time and you're good. And by the way, I just want to say this. Some of you might have saw on that screen like math, the, the M word. And here's some good news. I'm bad at math. And this is a good thing because I have a lot of patience and I can go really, I can really handhold people that struggle with the, astro the math stuff. So you have a very good guide. I'm not going to get snappy or impatient because as you're messing it up, I'm like, I'm right there too, but we're going to figure it out. Okay. And actually I want to look at the number. I don't know. Maybe you can see my calculator here. Now the, the number 360. So that number, the Babylonians gave us that number. Now here's why. I'm not going to go through it all, but you can, you can test this for your, so in a circle, in a degree system, you know, like minutes, seconds, and degrees, the Babylonians were so smart to come up with this 360. Now, why that number? There's like several different reasons that all converge. So because in a circle, we could have made up 250 or a thousand, we could have picked any kind of number. But what's interesting is back to the 12 and the 360, you can divide so many numbers into 360 so nice and evenly. Um, the number two divides into 360, three divides into 360, four divides into 360, five divides into six, six, 360, six divides into 360. I don't know about seven. I know eight does. There's maybe some other numbers there because I'm bad at math. And for certainly what's really interesting is 12 does. And that's why we get, now here's the other thing, 12 divided by 360 is 30, and we have about 30 days a month. And in a year, about 364, 365 days make a year. So for many of those reasons and others that we don't have time for, that number, they arrived at that 360 number. Genius. So um, that's why we, so to, to break down the math. This is important because it, I, I want you to understand the background. So when we start throwing these numbers around, you understand where they came from and how they, they build the whole structure of astrology, okay? So those two mindsets, thinking in 12, thinking in base 60, and um, thinking in cycles, that's going to be our practice for the next 12 weeks. So constellation. So in the olden days, they didn't have Netflix and they could only watch the night sky and it was gorgeous. And especially with only there, no like artificial lighting that kills off all the beautiful views. Many different cultures, by the way, had many different arrangements for the constellations. They had their own names and their mythologies that fit for that particular culture. But what's most interesting is most of the cultures grouped together the same stars in a significant way, more so than not. So I want to show just one example. So in the night sky, here's, you know, the sky. And then as we start to see, oh, well, there's these prominent stars here. And then as they would watch the stars and generations and eons, they would start to notice, well, this kind of looks like a, a pictograph. And then the picture kind of, we have meaning. And so there we have, you know, Orion, right? So now we have 88 constellations that we recognize in modern times. Why, why these 12 got so special? Well, because, okay, so here's the earth, right? And um, remember, here's the 30 degree system, the base 60. Now why these, so these are all the signs for the sacred 12 that we use. And that's because there's something called the zodiac, which in ancient, in Greek means a literally a circle of animals, okay? We got Aries the ram, Taurus the bull, right? There's a lot of animals there. And why these 12 is because the sun moves through the sky. And by the way, I'm very clear that 
the Earth is circling the sun. But again, from our geocentric vantage point, it occurs like the sun moves through the sky. And this line in the sky is called the ecliptic. Now the sun illuminates season by season only these 12 constellations, okay? So, so there's the sun's, um, and, and, and as you see, as the 365 days, the earth goes around in orbit, the sun will like will shine or light up each constellation. And each sign of the zodiac is 30 degrees. So there's about your 30 degree, 30 degree sun moves about one degree per day. It's actually a little, it's a, it changes by season, but just an, on average. Now, I also wanted to share this with you, okay? So, so here we have like Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. So there is the sign of Scorpio, right? Which is also really called Scorpius in the constellation. And many people have been arguing about this Ophiuchus being the 13th sign. And I wanted to share something like why they are harping on this is because Ophiuchus's foot barely touches that constellation of Scorpio. However, um, he's really, and, and it, as you can also see here, there's Ophiuchus, there's serpents, there's Hercules. Now, what I want to tell you is all four of these constellations form the archetype, the story of, the, they form the whole story of the archetype of Scorpio. And we could, and, and we might do this later in this class, we're going to go through each, um, and I have a, let me see it here. I have um, this table, and as you can see, the middle center line, this is the ecliptic, because the sun only goes through this. And it, um, there's other constellations that relate to that story that's in those 12 sacred signs, okay? Okay, so now what about the planets? So the planets um, actually also are Greek for the wanderers because they would notice this, the, we, we actually call them fixed stars, the constellations, they kind of stay in place. But these planets, man, they're moving all over the place. So um, I think I haven't, yes, here we go. Here's an animation. Now this is like one month in like one second, right? So the, the, the yellow sphere, I'm gonna replay that. That represents the sun, and then we have the signs of Mars, Venus, and Mercury, okay? And I'm gonna replay that. You can actually see Mercury speeding way ahead, and then it does this thing called retrograde, and it actually goes back, and then it pulls forward again. So let me explain what's going on here. None of the planets are actually moving backwards, but because of physics and our vantage point in outer space, they actually do appear like that um, if we were to watch uh, this is actually representing four months of time here. Um, we could actually see the, this happening in the night sky. And again, for the ancients, this was really easy to see because at nighttime, they could see much more of the stars. The planets were much more obvious to them. And, and they could, they, they, this was much more readily apparent. And um, all of the planets, except for Pluto, follow along this plate. And um, so they're all sort of in a narrow band in, in the sky, right? Uh, so just so you kind of get a motion of how this works. Now, why the sacred seven? And I'm gonna, we'll have a little fun with this. And those of you who habla espanol on this phone call, we're gonna put you to work a little bit. Okay, so now why the sacred seven? So the sacred seven, and I know that the sun is a sun, a star, and not a planet, but in astrology, you just call them all planets because they're all wanderers. They're all moving. So, um, you know, sun, moon, Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. Why those seven? Because you can only see with your naked eye out to Saturn. You cannot see the asteroid Chiron. You cannot see Uranus, Neptune, Pluto with the naked eye. And for thousands of years, astrologers only put those planets in the chart. 300 years ago, you wouldn't have a Pluto or a Neptune in your chart <laughs> if you got a reading. And, you know, they just, they did just fine. And actually, when we get into interpretation, and it actually helps with baby astrologers, because, you know, modern astrologers like to throw all this stuff and asteroids and all this stuff in the chart. 
And as a beginning astrologer, it's like too much information coming at you. And so we actually, I'm going to just put the sacred seven and you can still read the chart fine and it gives you a ton of info. Okay. Now I need somebody who habla espanol, por favor. I can do it if it's easy. It is muy simple. Okay. Okay. okay so Christina, could you say for us the, the days of the week in Spanish? Domingo, lunes, martes, miércoles, jueves, viernes, y sábado. Okay. So uh, for the gringos in the room, and, and we have this in English, Sunday, it's literally Sun's day, moon day, Monday, uh, uh, lunes in Espanol, right? Um, now in English, we have a mix of like Germanic and Nordic. So we have Tear, Tears Day, uh, Woden's Day, um, and then uh, Thor's Day, and Frida or Freya's Day, Friday, and then Satur Saturn's Day, right? So those are the sacred seven. And if you think about it, the number seven is a, it's a magical number, it's a sacred number, and we have lots of sevens, not just the day of the week. Who could think of some other sacred seven numbers? Uh, the notes in the scale, right? Aren't there seven? No, there's eight. Well, no, eight, yeah, C to C, a full scale. Seven, yeah. So there's the seven day. notes, but it's going yeah, C to yeah, C, yeah. Right, yeah. What else is there seven? Dwarfs. <laughs> Sacred yeah. to some people. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to argue. <laughs> How about There's we have like the I don't know like seven deadly sins. Uh huh. Yes, and there's also seven virtues in Christian, mm -hmm. you know, teachings. Yeah. Can you think of some others? Um, I'll give you some others that are coming to mind. We have seven chakras, right? Um, and like in a prism, if you like make the rainbow, there's like seven um, rays of color that also correspond with seven chakras. And so seven sacred number. And what do you know? There's seven wandering observable bodies in our, in our space surrounding us. So it's all connected, okay? So now we're gonna start talking about the ones, twos, threes, and fours. Now the one, uh, this is very difficult for human beings to have a direct knowledge and experience of. The one is where everything is unified there is no self or other, it's all connected. Many human beings only experience this sensation or framework of the one or the all in altered states of consciousness or heavy spiritual disciplines or uh, sacred plant medicine journeys or whatnot. And, and, and in those moments, we really can only approach it and, and kind of just barely even touch the surface. So the one is, is hard for humans to, to get, but this is the concept that beyond all the illusory divisions of time and space, there is this underlying substance um, and uh, that, that interconnects us all. We have lots of names. Some people call it God. Um, if you're atheist, you just may call it, you know, the, the physical universe. Um, whatever makes sense to you, uh, just so you can wrap your head around this, although this is very hard for humans to wrap their head around. Um, we don't live our lives always in the presence of the, the, the glory and the splendor of the one always. Um, that's challenging for human beings. But what we can wrap our heads around is the twos. So now um, we're going to go through this one by one, and I wanted to talk about, it's, it's called gender. So some of our language for astrology is very dated. It's from the medieval era. And so when I say gender in the word 2020, um, we have a very different concept. And even the ancients didn't really mean masculine, feminine, like man, woman. And I want to give you a way to sort of reprogram this. And I'm going to use the words masculine, feminine, because that's how I was trained. And that's how you're going to see these words. But I don't want you to freak out about this. So the masculine signs, and by the way, don't confuse yourself. Like you might be sitting here like, Joseph, I'm a female and I'm a dainty flower and I'm an Aries and I'm a masculine sign. It's like, no, no, no. That's just the terminology. Okay. Um, but here's the thing about all the masculine signs of the Zodiac is that they will 
act first and then figure out stuff later, okay? Where the feminine signs of the zodiac, they will wait and assess the situation and then they will make their move. Um, also, like the, the language yin and yang can fit here, okay? So the masculine signs, it's more immediate yang energy. And then the, the feminine signs, it's more like yin energy. It's like more receptive, and then I'll respond. Whereas the masculine signs are like, me, me, me first, and then, oh, then how are you? You know, so it's kind of just, it's that there, one is not better than the other. It's just how, it's like their polarity. It's like how their battery is wired, okay? Are you the sign that jumps first? And then, you know, shoot first and then ask questions or ask a lot of questions and then pull the trigger, right? So the, just a, a way to sort of like update that term gender and how we use it in astrology, okay? So I'm gonna go through, through these one by one. And um, I also wanted to ask a quick question. Is everybody familiar with the sigils, the signs, and how to make them? Okay, so Pandy, Ify. All right, so definitely if you're going to stay in this conversation, and even if you're not going to stay in the 12-week class, it's a really great idea to learn how to, like, draw. And um, I can send, you're going to get a couple of these slides, so you'll have all the signs. Okay, so I'm going to go to the signs slowly one by one but I'm going to start programming you with masculine, feminine, masculine, feminine, because that underpins the logic of the sign. So then when we start talking about the signs and then interpretation, I'm going to go back to the things that I talked about here and be like, is this a masculine sign? What's its quality? What's its element? And that relates to the person and the predictive astrology. It all ties together. And remember, the more that you get these basics under control and memorize like, like this, then the better you can interpret because then you don't have to spend so much time remembering the meaning and, and then making the interpretation, okay? All right, so back for the deep dive. So, there's, so this is Aries, and it's a masculine sign. We all have Aries. So Aries is right here on our faces. There's, there's Aries. And in medical astrology, Aries rules the head. And if you think about it, when a baby's born and it goes well, the head is the first thing to come out. That's the sign of Aries. And Aries also rules our first season, the sign of spring. So now knowing all that, that is the astro logic of the sign of Aries. They like to be first. They like to go out there and experience it. They have not asked all the questions. They are shooting first, and then they'll figure stuff out. <laughs> okay? So there's Aries. Aries is masculine. Taurus. Taurus is a feminine sign, and it rules the neck. You see how the symbol looks, looks like a necklace? Okay, so Taurus is feminine. And if you compare those two, if you can put like an Aries and a Taurus next to each other, you'll see that the Taurus is usually more calmer. They're more interested in other things. The Aries is more hot-headed and more spontaneous, right? So Taurus is feminine. They let, they let it all in, and then they'll make their move after much deliberation and stubbornness sometimes. Other keywords I'm going to pepper in the signs here. Aries, masculine, Taurus, feminine. Gemini, back to masculine. Gemini, the talker, the doer, the OCD. That's some masculine energy. It's go, go, go. And, and medical astrology, so here's Gemini. See my, my arms, there's the two there, and the lungs. See, it's like the two sticks right here, and then there's the other two. And then in Gemini and Mercury, they roll the edges of the body, fingers and toes are Gemini Mercury stuff. So Gemini masculine, not manly, masculine. <laughs> then Cancer, and if you look at it, and, and I'm telling you the medical astrology because it'll help you remember the sigil too. Cancer is here. It's, it's literally like the breasts area and it's also the stomach. Okay. Cancer is a feminine sign. Cancer is also one of the most fertile signs. So like generally speaking, if you have a female person and she is a cancer, she has a cancer son and maybe a bunch of planets in cancer, like she's, she's going to, 
easily have children, no problem. <laughs> the boop, boop, boop will come right out <laughs> if she wants to do that, okay? So Cancer is a feminine sign. Leo, masculine sign. The king of the zodiac, me, 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 going to be masculine. And um, so Leo in medical astrology, it's the heart, okay? Where's my heart? All right here. And then down the back, it's back and spinal cord, okay? That's your tail. You see the tail? Heart, and then sp spinal cord and tail, okay? Masculine. Virgo, feminine. Do not expect a Virgo to do anything unless they have all the facts and the details worked out ahead of time. Don't, don't do that to a Virgo. But if you got all your ducks in a row, oh, they're on board. Feminine sign. You, you've mentioned the other medicals, but not for Virgo. Oh, thank you. Virgo is the, the small intestine. All those details down there in the small intestine. All those little nutrients, little, all the a lot of little activity going on down there. There's other sub body parts. I'm not going to go like gallbladder and, you know, appendix. I'm just going to do the major stuff and it helps you also remember the sign. And it also symbolizes the personality of those people too. Because you think about the function of the small intestine, a lot of little details going on down there. Gemini, lungs, air sign. I mean, it's just, it all like, it all fits. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, oh, Libra. Sorry. Can't forget about them. Libra is a masculine sign. Libra is the lower back and the kidneys, okay? And you can literally see it looks like the lumbar region of your back. And also interesting in the sacred geometry, it looks like a sunset because it's the fall and the sun is waning in power in the fall in the Northern Hemisphere, okay? Masculine sign. Now, this one, this one always gets people. Scorpio is a feminine sign. And this one, okay, I'm going to just, because I've heard this before, you got to chew on the, Joseph, Scorpios? No, I know Scorpios. They're not feminine. But no, Scorpio is a feminine sign. They don't make their move until they've looked at all the angles. They've peered into your soul. And then they sting you with a Scorpio. <laughs> This helps us really get a deeper appreciation beyond the surface pop culture astrology. Scorpio is a feminine sign. They are strategic thinkers. So if a Scorpio's made their move, they already thought about it. Okay. That's also, uh, Pandy has a question. Yeah, the body part for Scorpio. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So this one's a little not PG rated. Okay. So it's the anus the elimination systems of the body, and the sexual reproductive organs. Scorpio is feminine. Sagittarius is masculine. And look at that arrow, man, that centaur. There, that is not a feminine sign. They're shooting that arrow out. Masculine. They go. Uh, body part is um, the thighs, quad muscles. And by the way, you, you'll, you'll sometimes see just uh, one cross on the Sag. Please do two, because Sagittarius is a twice crucified sign. We'll get into that later, esoteric meaning. And we have two thighs, right? Most people. So put those doubles there, please. Sagittarius is also connected to the liver, too, just to get into some sub-organs. Um, okay, Capricorn. It's a feminine sign. And this is another one, again, you, it may rewire you a bit. You're like, oh, no, I know Capricorns. They're very, like, eh, 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 you know? And nope, they, they're the, they think first, and then they make their move. They're, very, they're really watching the environment. They're more methodical. Okay? So feminine. Aquarius, the masculine sign. Hey, I had a question. Um, you may. What is the body part medical astrology that's associated with Capricorn? Okay, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting this. The knees. Okay. And it has to do with the skeletal structure and the calcium, cal I think calcium magnesium balance in the body. Calcium for sure. So if people have like Capricorn issues, there can be literal bone problems. Okay. 
And Capricorn is interesting because um, there's something about the knees. And when we go on our knees, it's a, sub, this is esoteric, but you guys, I think, like this stuff. Uh, and you're not going to see this in astrology books. Um, there's a submission. And, um, oh, I should bring out my tarot cards. Um, like if you look at the devil card in tarot, um, the, the figures are standing with the chain, but then there's something about being on your knees. In this group, I was worried about nobody having tarot cards. I don't know, what was I thinking? Uh, so while Carlos is getting that, I'll finish up with Aquarius. Aquarius is a masculine sign, and it rules the shins and that part of the leg. There's Mr. Devil, got his knees pointed up for us. And then there, it's not depicted on the card, but there is something about both as a good and a bad thing. When we go on our knees and we like, genuflect um, and we submit to something. Uh, sometimes we submit to an addiction, right? And that's a lot about the Capricorn archetype is we become enslaved to something usually physical. And then there's also the spiritual side is when you go down on your knees and you surrender to deity, the non-physical, the non-material. And that's a huge Capricorn lesson about because remember, Capricorn, it's the goat fish. It has this tough, it's the mountain goat in the front, but it's got a fish tail. That's the spiritual end of the journey of Capricorn. Capricorn has to give up all that materialism. Aquarius is um, a masculine sign. Okay, and then, so that leaves Pisces, feminine sign. And I think people can wrap their heads around that. People who know a lot of Pisces, you know, they're very receptive and they get a lot of visions that they receive sometimes um too much they, they pisces needs to work on developing healthy boundaries so they're, they're not so affected by everything coming at them okay oh and pisces is the feet in medical astrology you got your two fishes down there i've seen this with pisces they're like when you open up their closet they have like 50 pairs of shoes okay they, they literally like sometimes it's like that literal with some of the signs Questions about this masculine feminine business. Does this, does this help put in another layer of the signs? Okay. Isn't this cool? You like yeah, it? I think that it helps um, because I never learned it in the, that kind of term. So very useful. <laughs> this is essential. And by the way, this can also, if you're reading books on astrology and they don't start the conversation here, maybe check out another book because this directly relates to interpretation. And also, and by the way, part of this 12 week experience is you are going to come to know your own chart very deeply, even in better. And you're going to get the ultimate astrology reading of your life because we're going to, I'm going to send you your chart. And if you stay in this 12 week class, you're obvious. I want you looking at your chart and you're going to, so now you can start interpreting, Oh, I'm this rising sign. So what is feminine about it? What is masculine? What is the quality? Like you're going to see, your sign on a whole le different level that pop astrology doesn't t even touch. This is the mm -hmm. deep esoteric Western mystery tradition coming at you, okay? And I want you to have that because really astrology is about knowing yourself. Like um, in the Oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece, they had that saying, and really the ultimate mystery is you. And astrology is an amazing tool to study yourself and to know yourself. That's the ultimate. Okay. When we do signs next week, we'll go through each tarot card and also that they correspond. Remember, um, tarot, astrology, and Kabbalah, they all, they, they all talk to each other. Um, and I would recommend just Joseph talking that if you haven't gotten into um, like, you know, the tree of life, the Kabbalah, the path working, it's a big help to do tarot and astrology first and have that language before you jump in. If you went about it another way, nothing's wrong. So then now, like if you're taking this and you started with Kabbalah, it's gonna fill in more pieces for you on those tree of life conversations and the Sephiroth and the paths and all that. Um, yeah, it's hard to build because in tarot, feminine are more emotion driven and the, and the masculine sides are more rule driven. Yes. and please, wh whatever training and vocabulary that you got, so feminine and masculine means one thing in tarot, and don't mess with that. In astrology, <laughs> right. 
you or you may even want to rename it yin and yang energy we could do that okay. yeah aries is yang taurus is yin just so you don't confuse yourself i can totally play because remember how you got initiated through one teaching keep the vocab don't mess with it okay don't try to like overlap it like that got you okay yeah, i'm gonna say things like it is the truth and nothing but the truth and that's it but i'm only talking about astrology <laughs> if we're talking about another subject it's a different lexicon i got you okay yeah. cool thank you yeah no this is great My love, she baked me brownies to celebrate Ferris Wheel Day. And I dug in with much chagrin and ate five straight away. She baked them by the dozens, so there were plenty more. But ne'er would I have left them if I'd known what was in store. Oh, the elves, they owned the forest right where we stayed the night. With pointy ears and beady eyes, they planned their brownie heist. The elves, they loved their chocolate chips, our brownies made them weep. Those crafty elves, they waited until we fell asleep. They draped themselves in raccoon pelts of fur and claw they dared. Crept past our fire and lifted lids on all the Tupperware. They searched our campsite stem to stern, they found the goods she baked. They feasted and they drank our wine, left nothing in their wake. Well, the sun came up, we stretched our limbs and spied on our ascent. Twenty elves in raccoon pelts hung over by our tent. They stayed for beer and pancakes, then they staggered on back home. We promised to bring brownies the next time we would come. Oh, you never know how things will go, so bring enough to spare. Make it sweet and make it light and make enough to share. You never know how things might go when you begin your day. My love, she baked me brownies to celebrate Ferris Wheel Day. My love, she baked me brownies and the elves came out to play. My love, she baked me brownies to celebrate Ferris Wheel Day. Hey everyone. This is Alpandia, and it's time for another one of Pandy's Pagan Projects, the Pandemic Edition. If you're like me, you've probably been trapped at home during this entire crazy time that we find ourselves in. And so since I don't want to tax my local resources and I don't want to possibly get exposed to someone who might be sick or inadvertently expose someone who's not to something I may have, I have been looking for craft ideas that I can do around the house. And after much sorting and digging and YouTubing, I found the most interesting craft idea I think I've ever done. We're going to tie-dye with ice. So to do this, you're going to need cotton fabric, whatever you want to tie dye, whether it's a shirt, a pillowcase, some Ada cloth for your cross stitch, which is what I did, you'll want to make sure the fabric you're using is cotton. It will absorb the dye better. Next, you're going to need some powdered dye. You can use writ dye or tulip or whatever you have handy or can get access to from your local craft store or from your favorite online shopping place. You can also refer to those dye packets to see what sort of fabric they recommend that you use. After that, you'll need some outdoor space because this is messy. I would also recommend a bit of a bin and some wire mesh, which I used one of my cookie cooler sheets, but I've seen people use grated pizza grate, anything that will allow the liquid to come away from the fabric. And you need time and some heat and that's basically it so the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to read the instructions on the dye packet that you're using to make sure that you treat your fabric the right way some fabric you'll want to you'll need to treat with a mix of like salted water others you just need to have them wet so refer to your dye packet to see how they recommend that you pre-treat your fabric for the best results then you'll take your damp fabric and you'll put it on top of your grate, which you'll put on top of your bin. 
and this is just to collect all the water that our ice is going to generate. Oh, I forgot, you're gonna need a buttload of ice. Next, you'll crumple up your fabric in just kind of wad it up. Uh, if you wanna use like rubber bands like you do with traditional tie dye, you can do that. I just kind of wadded it up because it was what it kind of held its shape. And I did a couple fabrics at the same time. So I kind of put them kind of close together, but with enough space that they could have some gap between them. Once you have your fabric laid out on top of your grate, you'll want to cover it with ice. So what I did was I laid a kind of gentle layer of ice on top of my fabric, and then I piled on a bit more ice. Now you don't want to build an igloo. <laughs> You'll definitely want to have a nice kind of one to two ice cube layer of, of ice. You don't go crazy because you'll end up with a lot of a lot of white space. After you have your items packed in your ice, and make sure to get it like all over the place. Once it's packed in ice, sprinkle your powdered dye kind of randomly around on your ice. If you're doing all one color, that will be easier. I did a mix of blue and purple, kind of deeper colors with some hot pink thrown in because you guys know me, I make galaxy fabric. So definitely make sure that your ice is coated. It will look like the weirdest county fair ice you've ever seen but that's what you're going for. You wanna make sure to get all the sides, which I missed one whole side on mine, and so I have a big, nice white space. But the good thing about this is that you can actually re-dye it if you need to, which I'm about to start to do. Once you've sprinkled your dye on your ice, that's it. Leave it outside in the sun and let it let the ice melt. And as the ice melts, it will pull the dye into the fabric and it will pull it through the fabric and then you'll end up with really muddy water on the bottom but some really beautiful fabric on top at this point once all the ice is dry you'll want to once again refer to your dye instructions for how to set the dye colors sometimes that's rinsing in cold water sometimes it's rinsing in hot water sometimes it's using a gentle detergent but you'll want to follow those instructions on your dye packet to make sure that your your color is set and then once you have done that and you've rinsed your fabric until the water runs clear you'll want to wash it i recommend washing it in cold water all by itself on a gentle cycle and then hang it to dry and then you'll have some fantastic tie-dye and like I said, if you mess up, if you don't really like it, if something was in a weird spot, you can do it over. I have a spot that didn't quite take any dye because of how I had wadded my fabric. And I'm just gonna you kind of put my ice on that spot with some dye and see what happens. Uh, this is a great way to make altar cloths. This is a great way to make elemental cloths. This is a great fun activity you can do with kids you can like i did i dyed some eight o'clock that i had hanging around and i'm going to uh do some galaxy space themed cross stitching on it uh, but you can really dye anything as long as it'll hold dye you can dye it it is messy so you might also want to wear gloves while you do it um, but otherwise, this is a fun project and it kind of ties into my I'm going to dye all the stuff with stuff I have around the house theme that we have going on. Hope you guys are all safe and well and I can't wait to see what sort of fun crafty projects you're getting up to while we're all at home. Blessed be. Oh, wash your hands. Everybody at Reaching for the Moon. This is Raina Temple B, and today we're very, very lucky. We have the wonderful Byron Ballard here to uh, share with us a little bit about this um, powerful prayer that she wrote a number of years ago, which is really resonating with a lot of people right now during the 
extremely strange times that we live in. Byron is author of four books, a village witch, I guess. She can correct me if I'm wrong on that. She's also I am indeed. a teacher and appears at many festivals and conferences around the country and provides ritual services in her hometown area around Asheville. Is that right? You're in Asheville, right? I am in Asheville in Western North Carolina. Wonderful. Probably many people listening to this have heard about your work, um, and especially there was a recent story in The Wild Hunt. There's um, many Facebook groups of people who are trying to help with all the souls that have passed over during the COVID epidemic. You started the prayers at sundown, and that's really caught on with a lot of people. How do you feel about this becoming such a movement? I love it. And I, I find it so ironic that we, in the Northern Hemisphere, we are approaching Belkin. And, and to be thinking so much of the dead now is really interesting. So I just presented this as something that I was doing. And I, I try always to, to just do the work that's in front of me, the work that's given to my hands to do. And it felt important to me to acknowledge the passing of all these people and it grew out of, um, of a news report about bodies that were basically being uh, warehoused in New York because there were so many deaths, they couldn't process them fast enough. And they were doing mass, a mass burial, of a mass grave for all these bodies. And they were marking the caskets so that they could be uh, disinterred and then reinterred. But it just made me think of all those people who were going into the ground with no words said for them. So this prayer comes from my book, uh, Earthworks, Ceremonies in Tower Time, which came out a couple of years ago. And it's a, a prayer that we use at Samhain, but also that I use with my uh, death midwifery work. Thank you for bringing up the timing of everything. That was on my mind to ask you about. You know, sometimes we say in the craft that the Beltane is the other Samhain and there, you know, certainly the veil is, is thin now too, not maybe in the same way as Samhain, but uh, it is very interesting that all of these passages are happening during the Ostara Beltane time frame, and uh, maybe newer people to our path might have a harder time understanding that, but I don't know if you have anything else in terms of guidance on how to understand that. Well, if, if we think about the wheel of the year and we think about these two big hinges at Beltane and Samhain, it's, it's important, I think, for us to remember that we go through a cycle of seasons, whatever our seasons are in the part of the world we live in. But there are there, there's also the great cycle, is what I call it, and that's the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, and also the cycle of creation, destruction, and creation. So it's important for us as people who honor the cycles of the earth to also acknowledge that it's a, it's a coin with two sides, and one of the sides is life, and one of the sides is death. And to also think that in the Southern Hemisphere, our co-religionists down there are prepping for Samhain. So we really are balancing the work of two hemispheres in a way that we don't consciously do most years. That's beautiful. Yes, thank you. And um, lots to think on there and meditate on. So tell us a little bit about, if you, if you care to or remember, when you wrote this prayer, was there anything in particular that was on your mind at that time or something you were trying to achieve? I have been for many years doing um, prayers for the dead that were that were written by Caitlin Matthews, the Celtic scholar. She's extraordinary. Um, I've used her work and read her work for many, many years. She and her husband John are preeminent scholars of, of Celtic spirituality and Celtic culture. So when I was writing my book and Earthworks, the first half is about collapsing culture and how we deal with that and the last half of the book is all rituals and ceremonies so i contacted caitlin and i asked her if i could use her prayers for the dead in my book and she was very kind and and but 
was very clear that she didn't really control that. I'd have to go to her publisher and she said, and chances are it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. So I thanked her and then I thought, well, it's time for me to write my own prayer anyway. So I sat down at my altar and, and went into a meditative state and created this prayer from that to go in the book. And since then I have used it like countless times. And of course now I've been doing it at sundown for a couple of weeks. Um, every sundown I speak the prayer outside if I can. Tell us more about why it's important to be outside for that. Well, I'm an animist. <laughs> I need to be outside. I need to be outside as much as I can. Tonight we've got a huge storm blowing through western North Carolina, so I will probably not be outside tonight. Um, it's just I do best outside. I do. Even though I don't love super hot weather, and that will be coming at some point, I promise it will. Um, but it, to feel my feet actually on the soil is important, and to feel the breeze, all of that just, it, um, it feels like church to me. Yeah, I know that feeling. That's, that's a good feeling. Could you tell us just a little bit more about what death midwifery means to you? Oh, in the 90s, I went through a, a period of time where my friend's parents were dying. And in fact, my parents both died in the 90s too. And for whatever reason, I found myself tending to them at end of life and for many of them, tending them on their deathbeds. So I, I came to a point, as one does, where I basically said to the divines, um, I get it, I get it. You can stop now with the death. I get it, I can do this okay. And what it precipitated for me was, I took my third degree so that I became a high priestess and that was in 95, I think. Well, the divines, as they often do, said, yeah, yeah, we get, we get that you know how to do this and this is some of your work. So from that point until now, I have often sat by the bedsides of people that I know well and some people I don't know very well because it's something that, um, that I'm called to do as a, as a clergy person, as a pastor. So I do, I do a fair amount of that. And since I, I function both as the village witch in my community, but also I'm a very public priestess. So I, I sometimes get calls from the hospital because there is someone there who doesn't have a priestess and they would like to have that kind of ceremony wrapped around them. Um, so I've just, I've been doing that for a long, long time and some of the deaths are beautiful and profound and some of them are sad, but always they are powerful. To make that transition from matter to spirit is, is terribly powerful and profound. That's such holy work that you're doing, and uh, thank you for doing it, and also for just being able to explain it so clearly so that other people who might hear that call will know that they, they, can, they can answer. And, uh, yes, serve, absolutely. Serve that yeah, because if you are called to this work, and I think that's true about, about everything, really, but if you are called particularly to this work, there are ways to train to, to do it if effectively and efficiently. Lots of places you can do that now. My friend Angie Buchanan does a, a death midwifery course. Lots of people do. But it's important that we, that we go towards the end of life with the same sort of sense of curiosity and expectation that uh, the birth of a child engenders. Beautiful. Well. What are you working on now? I just um, turned in a book on Appalachian folkways to Llewellyn. Exciting. That will, that will come out winter of 2021. And I am working now on a book on deepening your spiritual practice through animism and permaculture in the wheel of the year. And that's for Red Wheel Wiser. And that, that gets turned in June the 1st. And that also is scheduled for a um, uh, winter spring of 21, 2021. I'm um, working on a, a musical. Um, I'm working on a book on Appalachia. 
And plus, I'm just so glad to be home doing pastoral work. I've been on the road for about three years, pretty nonstop. And it's nice. I'm sorry that it's at this time. I mean, I'm sorry for the reason to be home, but I'm really enjoying being here, growing a garden, cooking, cleaning the kitchen, <laughs> all those things you can't do when you are packing up the camping gear, jumping in the van and heading to the next event. So I'm very grateful for all that. So the big thing I'm doing truly is growing a beautiful garden. Beautiful. I've already eaten all the radishes. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. That's, that's the best possible outcome. I think the COVID gardens tradition is a, is a beautiful silver lining to this strange time. Gosh, me too. All the, uh, I've been thinking of them as neo victory gardens. Absolutely. They really are. They're a way for us to be re sort of self-reliant and resilient and remind ourselves that the earth regenerates and all those good yeah. things. That and sourdough bread. Every person I know is making sourdough bread. <laughs> There's a, there is a lot of baking and a lot of eating. Going on. <laughs> there is, there is. Okay, well, before I ask you to read this beautiful prayer, um, let's make sure we let people know how they can find you if they want to learn more about your books or your teaching. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm on Facebook a lot, and I'm there as both Byron Ballard and as Village Witch a Wandering. Um, as Byron Ballard, on my personal page, I've, I've maxed out the number of people who can be my friends. So people are welcome to follow me and see all the stuff, if that's important. I'm on Instagram, again, as Byron Ballard, and also Twitter, Byron Ballard. Uh, you can find my website is myvillagewitch.com. And um, I've got a blog there that I occasionally do. So yeah, you can get me in all those places. Easy, easy peasy. That sounds great. Wonderful. I hope you, I hope people uh, listening to this will check out Byron's books. They're all wonderful. I've read them and own them. And uh, um, thank you, Rain. You have such a unique voice. Um, I mean, I know there's a lot of magic workers in Appalachia, but you have put it into words and in a way that people find very accessible. And I think it's, it's powerful for that reason. Thank you. That's, that, that is my goal. So it's good to, he to hear that. Well, let's wrap this up then with the prayer for the dead. This is Byron Ballard offering the prayer for our practice, if we wish to use it at sundown, as so many people on our path are doing right now to help the souls of those who are passing due to COVID. I invite you now to take a nice deep breath with me, a deep grounding breath. And we begin. You have come to the end of this pathway in a journey to which we bear witness. You have come to the end of a pathway that is barred with a gate and a door. May this door open swiftly and silently. May this gate give you a moment's grace in which to rest your spirit before you venture through. We stand here with you as your companions as your family, for you are beloved. But for now, we must remain here. We cannot go with you to this old land, not yet. For you will see the ancestors. You will see the beloved dead. You will walk among the divine beings that guide and nurture us all. You go to dwell in the lands of summer and of apples where we dance, forever youthful, forever free. We can hear the music in the mist, the drums that echo our sad hearts. We can see your bright eyes and your smile. And so we open the gate. We push back the door. We hold the gate open. We glance through the doorway and with love and grief, and wonder, we watch you walk through. Hail the traveler, all those remembered in love, in honor, live on. Farewell, O oh best loved, O oh fairest, farewell. Well, thank you so much.
So let it be. That is just absolutely powerful. Thank you, Raina. Thank you very much. And if people want to find that prayer, uh, they can come to my Facebook page and it will, it's, it's there amongst the other things. In fact, I will repost it prominently now so that people can find it. Perfect. Thank good. you again for sharing this time with us. We appreciate it so much. And good luck on those writing projects. They sound really exciting. And we Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Happy Beltane. Happy Beltane. So free the voice, let it grow. Who we are is free to show. Free the heart, let it go. What we reap is what we sow. Free the heart, let it go. What we reap is what we sow.